Okay, I think we can start. So we have today the first lecture by Shlomo Razamat, who is talking about four-dimensional supersymmetric dynamics from six dimensions. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for inviting me to present these talks. It's great to be here. So I will be talking about some aspects of dynamics of four-dimensional supersymmetric theories from which you can deduce by thinking about uh, these theories starting from six dimensions. And I will not give too, too many references uh, during, uh, during the talk. So uh, the talk will be based on some papers I've written with a few, uh, several collaborators in the past uh, three, four years. And we will mainly cover subjects or some subjects which are covered in these papers, and, uh, but uh, the basics are detailed in the papers on the left. Okay, so let us start from some general considerations. Okay, so what do I mean by understanding uh, dynamics of four-dimensional n equal one supersymmetric uh, theories? Okay, so this is a huge subject. Uh, one can uh, one can study many many things. So in this first lecture, uh, I will give you some pictures mainly, not many equations but some pictures, an outline of the program that we are pursuing and what type of questions we are trying to answer and what, is the, what, what are the main approaches and what are the main challenges. And then in the remaining lectures, the, the amount of technicalities will uh, gradually increase. Okay? So th this will be our plan. So today I start from general consideration. So again, this is a very big question. Four-dimensional, uh, uh, n equal one four-dimensional Supersymmetric theories uh, occupied uh, ma uh, research of many, many people's, uh, people in, uh, in the last uh, 20 years. So what do I actually mean? What type of questions I want to answer? So let me start with very basic things. So a way we think about uh, quantum field theories usually is by d starting from some uh, uh, theory, uh, a conformal field theory in the UV. Okay? You start from some starting point. Typically, this starting point historically is taken to be some free theory, or which is given in terms of some weakly coupled Lagrangian. Okay? There is, you don't turn on any interactions in the beginning. You just have some collection uh, of fields. And then you turn on interactions and uh, some relevant deformations. And then you flow, you have an RG flow to a new uh, fixed point, to a new uh, CFT which we'll call CFT in the IR. Okay. And this CFT in the IR can have a variety of behaviors. For example, it can be an interacting CFT. It can be a very non-trivial one. It can be a gapped theory. Okay. There might be nothing there. You just might flow, start with some degrees of freedom, and end up uh, in, the, in the IR with an empty theory. It can be a free theory. It can have free matter fields or free gauge fields. So there is uh, some uh, variety of behaviors that, uh, that such a flow can lead to. Okay. And there are many interesting questions that you can ask about such energy flow. So what we call a QFT is usually what happens in between these two CFTs, okay? what uh, the interesting physics which happens in between. And some, some uh, types of the questions that you can ask are, uh, are the following. So what, for example, can you learn about the, inter the, the IR fixed point, the IR conformal field theory, just looking at the UV starting point? Okay? In principle, the moment you defined a UV starting point, you can compute anything you want. Okay? You can just solve the renormalization group equations in principle and then deduce anything you want about the fixed point. But typically, this, this procedure is very hard to do in practice. Okay? It's very hard to understand what type of theory you will get in, in the infrared. For example, one thing which will occupy main focus of these talks is what is the symmetry of the theory in the infrared? Okay? This seems like a very simple question. For example, you can, have, you can start in in the UV with a theory which has some symmetry, which we will call GUV. And by uh, this symmetry, I don't mean the symmetry of the free Lagrangian, but the symmetry of the, of the theory once you already have chosen the vacuum and you have turned on the interaction, so that the, the, the symmetry in the beginning of the flow, if you wish. 
And then there is a question, what will be the symmetry in the infrared fixed point? What will be the G in the infrared? And typically, the symmetry in the infrared, in many cases, it will be the same as the symmetry in the UV, but in some cases, it can be bigger. Okay? Some degrees of freedom that were there in the, in the UV that were transforming non-trivially uh, under the symmetry in the UV might become massive, might decouple in the IR, and the symmetry might be bigger. Okay? So this will be one of the main questions we will ask. What, will, what is the symmetry in the IR and the symmetry, if, you, if I tell you the symmetry in the UV, or the theory in the UV? And there are many, many other questions. So let me list several questions. Some of them will, we will try to answer, and some of them will just serve as uh, guiding principles, as kind of uh, questions which will guide our research, what we want to do. So question number one is a very general question. It's a very interesting question. And if I'm talking about questions, ask me questions. Okay, feel a bit silly just talking. It's okay. So question number one, which is a very uh, uh, tricky question, uh, which we will not answer in this uh, in, in this lectures, but we will. Uh, this is where uh, we are heading to, is of the following nature. Given some strongly coupled CFT. Okay. Somehow you manage to produce a strongly coupled CFT. Is there always a weakly coupled flow leading to it? Okay. So one thing that you can understand immediately from this picture, that although historically we are uh, taught, that's how we are, uh, we are discussing quantum field theory in uh, classes, we are uh, starting from free theory with Lagrangians, and then we are uh, studying these types of theories. But the CFTs that we can obtain in the, in the infrared can be strongly coupled. And once we understand that, that strongly coupled CFTs exist in nature, well, you can ask yourself, what happens if you start from this CFT and think of it as some new CFT in the UV? Let's call it CFT in the UVB, and perform some relevant deformation, and you flow to a new CFT in the IR, which, again, might have a variety of uh, behaviors. It, again, might be interacting and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, there is no, nothing holy about this free starting point. You can just start from the interacting CFTs flow to some other CFTs. And then a natural question is, is any interacting CFT, any non-trivial CFT, accessible through such historically preferred starting point? Okay. Is any CFT, does any CFT has a, a weakly coupled theory or a free theory which flows to it after some deformation? So let me give you one example of such a theory uh, which has such a flow, an example of a theory uh, which we believe is uh, interacting and it has a weakly coupled uh, flow leading to it. Okay, so this is a, our first example, simple example. So let us take minimally supersymmetric uh, theory in four dimensions. And uh, again, I will stress that all, this, uh, all these talks will be about minimally supersymmetric theories in four dimensions. We will have higher dimensions, six-dimensional physics and five-dimensional physics entering into considerations. But the main interest of the talks will be n equal one uh, uh, theories in four dimensions. So uh, let us take a, maybe one of the simplest theories you can consider. An n equal uh, one SU2 gauge theory, uh, SQCD, with five flavors. And uh, to remind you the, what this theory is, this theory, uh, this theory has an SU2 gauge group, okay? uh, uh, and uh, the vector multiplet is an n equal one vector multiplet. And then we have five fundamentals and five anti-fundamentals, which you can uh, denote by Q and Q tilde. So this transforms in the fundamental of SU2. This transforms in the anti-fundamental of SU2. But for SU2, these are uh, the same representation. So there is uh, no real difference. There will be a difference for other groups. So one can start from such free theory and then turn on gauge interactions and flow to some, uh, to some theory in the IR. 
And the claim is that this theory in the IR is some interacting CFT. Okay. Uh, this was, this uh, uh, discussion of these types of theories was done 20 years ago. There, uh, if one studies SUN gauge theories with NF flavor, so we, here we have a special case of N equals two and NF equals five. Then there is something called uh, uh, conformal window uh, for some range of parameters and then an F. It is believed that the theories flow to an interacting CFT. If you are outside of this range, uh, you might uh, flow to a free theory. Okay? And uh, what details of this conformal window will not be interesting to us, but such a, this is an example of a flow where you start from a free theory and you flow to an interacting CFT. However, in the recent years, we have learned that not all theories that you can consider are as simple as that, okay? If we would not know of any theories, any strongly uh, interacting theories which are not of this type, this question wouldn't have ar uh, arisen. But there are examples of theories that one can consider which, uh, we, for existence of which we can argue in various ways and for which we don't know of a start, weakly coupled starting point in the UV which will flow to these theories. And many of these examples, or the canonical such examples, have a little bit more supersymmetry, n equal to supersymmetry. And the reason it is easier to argue for existence for such theories with more supersymmetry is that more supersymmetry is more constraining. Basically, you can list all the possible Lagrangians with n equal to supersymmetry. With n equal to supersymmetry, the, the only choices you have to, in writing Lagrangians is the choice of the gauge group, choices of representation of the matter, but basically everything else is fixed. So you can just list all the possible Lagrangians and, Lagrangians and study their properties. And then by more sophisticated techniques coming uh, from, uh, from different places, for example, string theory and so on, you can deduce existence of strongly coupled theories which, have weird, which should have n equal to supersymmetry, but they have weird properties. For example, some of these theories have uh, symmetry groups which, are, uh, which you cannot engineer using this very, very simple n equal to Lagrangians. For example, symmetry groups which are E6, E7, E8, okay, these theories are usually called Minahan and Mishansky theories. There are theories which are called Argyros-Douglas theories. Argyros-Douglas theories. For which some operators in these theories have some weird fractional charges which you cannot, just by looking at the Lagrangians that you can write, uh, you cannot find the Lagrangian for which these charges appear. Some protected operators with weird charges and there are no Lagrangians that you can write which have these charges. Okay, so you start, if you want to discuss theories which have manifest n equal to supersymmetry, if you insist on having all the symmetries manifest in the UV starting point, both uh, supersymmetry and, uh, and other symmetries, you just cannot write any Lagrangian. Okay? So that's how we know that the question exists. And moreover, They come from a very sophisticated type of flow. You, you, you mean, it's not, I would say, you, you, you need to do something fancy. Okay, you go on a Coulomb branch, you take something, some kind of a scaling limit, and then you derive by consistency of the whole picture that there should be a CFT, and it should have these types of properties. Okay? It's an example of, it's an example of the, of the case where you don't, you, you, don't start, you don't start with the weakly coupled theory and you flow. Okay? You tune parameters, you do something fancy. I agree with you that it is a, it's a little bit shakier than Minahan and Meshansky okay? in, in this type of examples. But again, it's not just that you start from free fields, you just turn on some, some interactions and you flow to these theories. And in recent years, we have derived many, many more examples of such, uh, of such, uh, of such phenomenon. Uh, and uh, we will get uh, to them maybe later in the lectures. So by now, we know of existence of a large variety of theories with n equal to supersymmetry. 
for which we don't know of an interesting, uh, of a useful weakly coupled starting point from which we can flow to those theories. Yes. You just can list all the possible Lagrangians with n equal to supersymmetry and ask where, like, what are the global symmetries of these theories, and you just cannot find such uh, cases. Okay. So this is one question we would want to address. Okay, question number one. Question number two is of the following sort. Okay. So question number one is, is there a flow leading to a certain CFT? A question number two is of the sort, how many different flows can lead to the same CFT in the IR? And again, we know of many examples, and I will give you some, where you have some CFT which is strongly coupled, see some CFT in the IR, to which uh, you can flow starting from very different Lagrangians. There is one CFT U, UV that you can choose. There is another CFT UV that you can choose. There are many different uh, starting points from which you can start and flow to the same uh, theory. Okay? This goes under the name of universality or IR duality. Okay? You start from theories which are different in the UV. They look differently, but they, uh, once you flow to the infrared, you flow to exactly the same CFT. And one example that I will give you is, again, uh, of, this, uh, of this sort. So you can start from an SU2 theory with uh, five flavors and flow to some CFT in the IR. Okay? This is our starting point in the UV. And there exists, an exists another starting point which looks very, very different which is an, S, uh, uh, an SQCD with a different gauge group, an SU3 gauge group. Again, plus five flavors. And which has some gauge singlet fields. And details are not uh, important uh, uh, for now. Okay? Very different theory, which nevertheless is argued uh, to flow to exactly the same uh, fixed point. Okay? There are... Uh, the, the, this is an example of, uh, of an IR duality, which is called also cyber duality. The, in mo most of the cases maybe in this, of these types were discovered by cyber and his collaborators 20 years ago, where you can relate SUN gauge theories with an F flavors to SUN F minus N gauge theories with an F flavors and some singlets. Okay. So there is another question that one can ask is what are the universality classes of flows? Okay. Starting from two different Lagrangians, starting from two different theories in the UV, is there a way to know that they should flow to the same fixed point? Okay. Here it's very hard to guess if I give you two very different looking uh, starting points that they will flow to the same CFT in the infrared. Is there a way, is there a mechanism, is there an algorithm to tell us that two given theories will flow to the same uh, fixed point? And in general, there might be more than two theories flowing to the, to the same fixed point. There might be some equivalence classes. And of course, you can have a very, very complicated network of flows when you start from two, several different theories, you flow to another theory, and then you start flowing from it, and you flow uh, to yet, uh, depending on which types of deformations you turn on, you, you flow to a variety of theories, and then this, some of these flows might be equivalent again. So there is a very, very sophisticated picture of RG flows that we can have, and there is a question of what is the organizing principle. Okay? So there, this is a question number two. The question number one we are not going to answer in these lectures, but we will have some answers about question number two. Okay? At least some progress in answering uh, this question. Now, if you look at this particular example of duality, it has also a very interesting property. As I already mentioned, this theory, SU2 with five flavors, has five fields 
in the fundamental representations and five chiral fields in anti-fundamental representation, but fundamental and anti-fundamental are equivalent here. So the symmetry that you have in the UV is actually SU10. So you can rotate all the 10 chiral fields that you have, ten, five fundamentals and five anti-fundamentals into each other, and the symmetry group that you have in the UV for this particular example is SU10. However, for this theory, since for SU3 there is a difference between fundamental and anti-fundamental representation, they are complex conjugate, the symmetry group is only SU5 times SU5 times U1. So the global symmetry uh, with which you start in these two dual theories is different, okay? So the only chance for this duality to be true is that the symmetry that you obtain in the, in the IR fixed point is consistent with both symmetries. So it has to be at least a SU10. And from the point of view of this description, the symmetry should enhance in the infrared, okay? You start from a smaller symmetry and the symmetry becomes bigger in the infrared. Okay? So this is an example of enhancement of symmetry. Okay? And there are many examples like that that are known. So question number three that we will ask, and again, we'll have some partial answers to, is given GUV, what is GIR? Okay? How can we determine uh, the infrared symmetry starting from the UV symmetry? Again, I will not give you an answer, you know, of this type. Give me a group theory, sorry, a, a gauge theory with certain group, gauge groups and certain matter content. I will not be able to tell you what the symmetry in, in the infrared will be, but we will build some kind of a framework where you can ask these types uh, of questions. And finally, let me mention uh, two other questions which are a little bit more generic, and again, one can have them in mind while discussing these topics. So nothing is special, uh, special about symmetry. Symmetry is something we, we like, we understand well, so we can ask questions about symmetry, but we can ask que more general questions, uh, which I already mentioned. What about IR can we easily deduce from UV. Again, in principle, we can deduce anything the moment we have a Lagrangian, uh, but usually uh, uh, did, making this deduction is a hard problem. So the question here is what easily can be done. And the uh, symmetries we will see in some cases can be deduced uh, rather easily. And yes. Can you speak a little? Nothing breaks them. All the interactions uh, are consistent. Slavon, sorry, can you repeat the questions? Because most of the time we cannot hear. The okay. so, so the question is why symmetries are not broken uh, during the flow? There is nothing breaking them. Okay? There has to be something breaking them, and nothing is breaking them. What can happen is that suddenly nothing is charged under a symmetry. So some symmetry acts trivially. So some degrees of freedom that were rotated by symmetry, you know, so they become massive. And once you go below a certain energy scale, nothing is charged under that symmetry. So you don't see anything uh, non-trivially happen. And again, I'm not talking about... Yes, 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 yes. Symmetry is symmetry. You know, I, I take the modern stance that there is no such a thing as gauge symmetry. There is symmetry. Okay, by symmetry, I mean global symmetry all the time. Gauge symmetry is the way uh, we describe the theory, but global symmetry is some property of the spectrum of the operators. Okay, so, uh, so this, is, uh, this is another question we can ask. And finally, a more general question, which really is an Im important question and, uh, and that we would like to answer. And that question is, can we classify all possible n equal one CFTs and say in four dimensions. Okay, this is a big question. 
So can we make a list? Can we build a store where, you know, on the shelves we have all the possible theories, all the possible descriptions, and say some experimentalists come to this store and ask for a theory which has a certain property, and we give them a list of theories which can satisfy their needs. Is the store we have now, starting from weekly couple theories, some Lagrangian, is it complete? Is it incomplete? Are there some beasts in uh, that, some CFTs that can exist that can, cannot have such description? If an experimentalist asks for a theory which has a certain symmetry, what type of theories we want, uh, we, we will be able to give the experimentalist? Do these theories have manifest symmetries in, in the UV or we can give them say, uh, theories which only have the symmetry, emer symmetries emerging in the IR? Can we find such theories and so on? Okay, so these are the big questions. Questions. Questions about questions. Okay. So once we lay down the questions, we can ask what are the approaches? What is the approach which we are going to undertake to answer these questions? Okay. And there are two main approaches in the market. Okay, what are the approaches? So approach number one, which we will not going to undertake, is as follows. We are talking about uh, conformal field theories. We are talking about flows between conformal field theories. So conformal field theories are important in understanding uh, QFTs. They are the starting points and they are the end points. So conformal field theories, in addition to the global symmetries that we have discussed and supersymmetries, they have also what is called conformal symmetry, and this symmetry is very constraining. Okay? And we can try to use this symmetry to fix everything, or almost everything, as much as you can. You can try to use symmetry and maybe some extra input, like some minimal amount of input, something about what are the types of operators, like simplest operators that you have in this theory, and uh, try to fix everything about the CFT possible. Okay. So this is, goes under the name bootstrap, conformal bootstrap. It's a very uh, popular endeavor, and I think you will hear more about it from in Leonardo's uh, talks uh, later on. So in this approach, you kind of, you center yourself on symmetry. Okay? Symmetry is important. You take uh, symmetry as your main guiding principle, and you try to deduce from it everything you can, but you don't care where, whether your theory has a weakly coupled Lagrangian or doesn't have a weakly coupled Lagrangian? Can you write it in terms of field or you cannot write it in terms of field? This is an unimportant input in this approach. All you care about is what are the symmetries of the problem. Okay, so here you, uh, you make symmetries holy and you don't care about Lagrangians. Okay. This approach is not uh, very useful to, for some of the questions we have asked. For example, we have asked questions about emerging symmetries. Okay? If you start from one conformal field theory and you flow, how the symmetry uh, emerges, uh, to what, symmetry, what type of symmetry you get in the infrared. So we should not make too much use uh, of the symmetry, both because the global symmetry can emerge and because some flow is involved, and the conformal symmetry only is recovered at the endpoints. Okay. So what we will do, we will take another approach, in a sense, complementary approach, and we will not take uh, symmetry to be holy. Okay. So what we will do, in some sense, we will give up symmetry, Okay, at least some parts of the symmetry. We will not center our approach uh, on deducing things by starting from symmetry, but we will insist on having weakly coupled uh, descriptions. Okay, you will not see a 
non-Lagrangian theories uh, in this talk. We will have always uh, Lagrangians. Uh, and uh, by studying these Lagrangians and studying flows interrelating the Lagrangians, we will try to answer the questions that uh, we have posed. So these two approaches seem very different. They are, in a sense, uh, complementary. Okay? So in the bootstrap approach, what happens is that in this picture of the flow, you focus on the starting and end points of the, of the flow. Okay? So this is the approach number one. You try to understand everything about the CFTs from the symmetries. And what we will try to understand, we will un try to understand what are the flows interrelating different types of constructions. Okay? So this is a complementary approach. One caveat that I need to stress is that uh, is of the following nature. As I, uh, as I stressed already several times, we will always have some supersymmetry, and we will be in four dimensions. The reason we will insist on supersymmetry is because supersymmetry gives us some technical tools to answer the, the questions we want to answer. However, once you understand that some symmetries can enhance during the flow, also super, you, you should, you should be, be aware of the fact that supersymmetry can enhance during the flow. And if you want to understand, for example, all the possible supersymmetric theories, okay, some of them might have a weakly coupled description, but this weakly coupled description might be not supersymmetric. The supersymmetry will, uh, will enhance. So we will always assume supersymmetry. We will make some progress using this assumption, but you should remember uh, this ca caveat. We will always assume that there is a, a supersymmetric the, that there are supersymmetric flows leading to the theories we want uh, to study, and this is an assumption which just might be plainly uh, wrong. Okay, and uh, uh, before uh, continuing to actually telling you what 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 will be what will be the, the technicalities of this approach, let me give you an interesting example of supersymmetry enhancement in four dimensions that uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's the first uh, example uh, in four dimensions uh, that appeared. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people who were around back then can uh, correct me. Yes? Can you say again? No, the yes, conformal bootstrap. Did you ask about the, the bootstrap? Yes, in bootstrap you are always. Sorry, Slomo. If if you can always repeat the question. For, I'm not for, sure I understood the, the question, but let me answer the question I understood, so I cannot yes. repeat it. But uh, let me know if uh, if I'm wrong. So in the conformal bootstrap again, as I have uh, written here, you always are stuck at the conformal point. You don't have any flow. Yes, you can see. Uh, that's an excellent point. So it's not when you study uh, a CFT, you know you don't study the flow, but you definitely can get an information where you can go from that point. You can understand what are the relevant deformations, what are the operators, which you can add to the, Lagrange, to the, to the theory, to the action of the theory, so that it will start the flow. So you do. So again, these are not completely, you know, not overlapping approaches. There is an overlap. From here, you can learn something about the RG flow, and in the approach we will undertake, we will learn something about the fixed point. Okay? Does this answer the question? Yes. Yes. That's a very good question. So this is this, this, this goes back to the question number one that I posed. Okay, this is the question. Okay, can you formulate such a, 
uh, such a condition, for example. That would be great. Okay, okay so let me give you an, an example of, uh, of supersymmetry enhancement that is extremely simple. Okay, so we all know and love n equals 4 uh, as uh, super young mills in four dimensions. Okay? It's a very uh, useful theory in many, many contexts. And you might know that n equals 4 super young mills with SU2 gauge group, maybe the simplest uh, theory, has a dual description. Okay? This theory you can think of, again, as Lie algebras, this is the same as an SO3 uh, group. And uh, S, uh, n equals 4 super young mills has three adjoint fields, and adjoints for SO3 are the same as vectors. So there is another description of this theory in terms of n n equal 1 gauge theory with gauge group, which is SO4 plus three vectors plus some gauge singlets. Okay? This duality was, uh, it's a special case of uh, SO and Cyberg duality. Okay. There is a duality between SO n and SO n f minus n plus four gauge theories that Cyberg has discussed. And for a uh, very particular case, oh, when, the, when n is equal to three and you have three, uh, the number of vectors is three, you have this, uh, this duality. So this is an example, an extremely simple example of enhancement of uh, supersymmetry. Here you have a conformal field theory. You have a, really a conformal description on, of some fixed point. And here you have an n equal one flow which flows to that uh, theory. The supersymmetry here is only n equal one and it emerges, the, it, the, it enhances to n equals four only in the infrared. Okay, and we will have something more uh, to say about this uh, later on. Okay. So, if we are giving up symmetry, we need to have some, some other guiding principle which will let us make progress on, uh, on uh, answering these questions. Okay. We cannot just give up symmetry and do something useful. Okay. We need some other guiding principle. So the guiding principle that we will have, another guiding principle that we will have, will be geometry. Okay. And let me discuss now what I mean by geometry. Okay. So what we will do, we will discuss another way to engineer four-dimensional CFT. So one way to engineer a four-dimensional CFT is to start from another four-dimensional CFT and then flow to it. Okay? However, what one can do, one can start from a CFT living in, a num in a, another number of dimensions. Okay? So one can start from some theory, for example, living in six dimensions. Okay? You can start from a CFT in six dimensions, and then you can put this six-dimensional CFT on some compact geometry. Okay, and let's say this geometry is of scale L. Okay? And then the, what will happen if you will consider this six-dimensional theory on this compact manifold at energy scales which are much smaller than the energy, give, than the energy scale given by the size of this compact geometry, you will get an effective 4D theory. Okay, you will have some four-dimensional theory in the infrared. Okay? Sometimes this four-dimensional theory will be an interacting CFT. Sometimes it will be a uh, free CFT, and so on. The same words we said about four-dimensional flows can be said also here. Here, re the relevant deformations were, for example, some operators, some relevant operators you can add to, uh, to the Lagrangian. You can give some vacuum expectation values to some operators. Here, in this picture, the relevant deformation is geometric. You put your theory on some manifold, which has some scale. You break, uh, you break conformal uh, symmetry by introducing this scale. You flow to some effective theory, which uh, is effectively a four-dimensional theory. So this is just another way to engineer uh, four-dimensional theories. Okay? 
And what we will be after, we will be after uh, uh, descriptions of such flows starting from four-dimensional Lagrangians. Okay. Okay. Let us assume that the theory we get by this geometric compactification is some interest, interesting interacting SCFT. And what we will want to find is there a four-dimensional Lagrangian which flows to the same CFT. And in some cases, we will find such Lagrangian, and we will make a dictionary. We will find a dictionary between this type of geometric compactifications and Lagrangians in four dimensions. And then the fact that the, the, the formations of the six-dimensional theory you start with are labeled by some simple mathematics, by simple uh, geometry, will give us some very, very simple tools to answer some of the questions we have posed. Yes. No, we will not assume a Lagrangian. This is an excellent point. The six is theory, more, I'm, I'm sorry. So the uh, question is, uh, yes. is the six-dimensional theory, uh, is the higher dimensional theory we start to, with a Lagrangian theory? Does it have a Lagrangian? We will not assume that, and this is, will not be true. The six-dimensional theories will be some strongly coupled theories. They are very hard to study by themselves. But the fact what we will study is not these theories by themselves, but these theories compactified on some geometry. And well, well, we will see that the fact that there is this geometry there uh, fixes a lot of the properties of this CFT without knowing much details of this 6D. This, this will be the magic of what we will do. Okay? This starting point is complicated, but it will allow us to find certain Lagrangians, which will claim have certain properties, and these properties will be labeled by geometric information, and making use of this geometric information, we will be able, for example, explain enhancements of symmetry of this, or, or supersymmetry of this uh, type. Okay. More questions? Sorry? Six dimensions will give us some rich starting point. Like, we, we will have a lot of, uh, there, there are several answers to that. I will answer a little bit more in detail later on. But one kind of a quick answer, which doesn't go in any detail into the physics of these things, is that Riemann surfaces are rich enough objects, two dimensional surfaces are rich in, in enough objects, which will allow us enough, you know, different tools to answer the questions we are after. There are other questions. For example, we, there are other answers to your questions. Like we can at most go to six dimensions because we insist on supersymmetry, and six dimensions is the highest number of dimensions where superconformal theories exist, for example. But you can, in principle, ask this question starting in five dimensions. Okay. So this is the general idea. That's what we will do. And now let me give you a feeling why this idea is useful. Why thinking about things geometrically, we, make, we can make progress. Okay. And the, the idea is very, very simple. Okay. The idea is of the following sort. So let us start from six dimensions okay, with some theory T6D. So we are in this situation. We start from some T6D. We put it, we put a theory on some kind of geometry. Okay? And geometry, again, is some two dimension. In our case, it will be some two dimensional surface, some Riemann surface. And we can turn on some flux. Flux will be some background com uh, configurations for, uh, um, for, uh, for vector fields uh, coupled to the uh, conserved currents of the global symmetry that the six dimensional theory can have. We will discuss that in more detail. So we make these choices. We make the choice of the Riemann surface, and we make the choice of fluxes. And we end up in some four-dimensional theory. And what is the four-dimensional theory we end with is determined by the choice of the six-dimensional theory, by, by, by the choice of the uh, geometry, and by the choice of fluxes. In particular, even if you start with the same six-dimensional theory, you can end up in wide variety of four-dimensional theory, 
depending on what are the choices of ge geometry and fluxes you have chosen. Okay? So there are many, many, many choices you can make, and this leads to many, many different uh, four-dimensional theories you can have. And the magic which happens, which allows us to make progress, is that sometimes understanding what this four-dimensional theory is, the, this question factorizes. Okay? And it factorizes in the following sense. Say you can think of this Riemann surface as being, in some sense, sum of two Riemann surfaces. And the flux is sum of two fluxes. And by sum here of geometry, say, literally mean you have some, for example, some Riemann surface. For example, a genus two Riemann surface. This is your C. But you can think of it as gluing together, a geometrical gluing together of two Riemann surfaces. One is genus one with, with a hole, with a puncture, and another of the same type. And you just combine them together. You geometrically glue them together. Okay? So this will be C1, and this will be C2. There is some flux which is supported on this uh, genus two Riemann surface. And we can separate, we can find some configurations where this flux is separated into uh, F1 and F2, which are in turn localized on the two different pieces of this geometry. Okay? Literally, F is equal F1 plus F2. Okay? And we will discuss this in more detail later on. Uh, yes. For a, a given Riemann, uh, here. Yes. Uh, for a given Riemann surface uh, of uh, some genus and punctures, uh, the decomposition into uh, further Riemann surfaces may not be unique. Uh, yes, so I will come to this in a moment. Okay. I'm saying just take any decomposition you want. Okay. Pick a decomposition, decompose, decompose the flux in any way you want. Okay. Also, this you can do in many ways. We will discuss it in, a two, in two minutes. Just do some kind of decomposition. Think of this Riemann surface and flux as just sum of two components. In some favorable situations, which we'll discuss in detail, what you can do is you can first understand what happens in this flow when you study compactifications of the same 6D theory on this piece and on this piece, and then combine them together. Okay, already in four dimensions. So first you understand what happens when you compactify this T6D on C1 with flux F1. You get some 4D theory. Okay? Then you get another 4D theory when you start from the same 6D theory on surface C2 and flux F2. Okay? These are different flows. You start from same 6D theory and compactify on this surface with F1, on this surface with F2. You get some two different, possibly four-dimensional theories, and then you combine them together in 4D. Okay? And this combination of the theory, concatenation of theories in four dimensions, as we will see, corresponds to gauging of global symmetries, of some global symmetries. So the re what will, will happen is that complicated questions, let me uh, uh, phrase it, in analysis, okay? and by analysis I mean, as we discussed in the beginning, understanding these RG flows, understanding how, uh, how for example, anomalous dimensions behave, what are, how this flow behaves in solving the beta function equations, will translate into simple questions in algebra and geometry because of this type of relation. This relation doesn't exist always, not for any 6D CFT, and not for any choice of the data. Such a, such a factorization of the problem exists. At least we don't have evidence that it always exists. We have many examples that such thing happens, and that those examples we will discuss. And using these examples, we will be able to answer some of the questions. For example, one of the questions which will be easy to answer using such factorization will be enhancements of symmetry, okay? emergence of symmetry in four dimensions. So how does it go? So the symmetry, let us, uh, let us assume that the theory in six dimensions has some symmetry, which we'll call G6D. Okay? When we turn on fluxes, this symmetry is broken explicitly. Okay? Fluxes, again, are just some explicit gauge fields we turn on. Okay, 
which transform under this, uh, under this global symmetry in six dimensions. So we explicitly break some of the six dimensional symmetry when we compactify. Okay? So the symmetry in four dimensions is determined by the symmetry in six dimensions modulo these fluxes. So the commutant of the flux in the global symmetry will give us the global symmetry in four dimensions. Okay? For example, if you have simple group, say an SU2 gauge group in six dimensions, and you turn on a flux for the Cartan generator of this SU2, say the flux will be equal to uh, plus one, then the symmetry in four dimensions will be broken from SU2 down to U1. Okay. Again, we will discuss it in, in more detail later on. Okay. So now what happens in this type of constructions is as following. You can understand first compactification of this sort and say with flux, which is equal to plus one, and then the symmetry of the four-dimensional theory will be U1. Okay. You can understand a, another compactification, say, of this sort where the flux is minus one. The symmetry will be still equal to U1 in four dimensions. But when you combine these theories together, this combination should correspond to a compactification on a surface which flux of which is just the sum of these two fluxes, which is zero, and that means that the six-dimensional uh, symmetry is not broken. And that means that the symmetry that you should get in four dimensions is SU2. But from this perspective, this symmetry will be emergent. This four-dimensional theory has a U1 symmetry. This four-dimensional theory has a U1 symmetry. You just take two of these theories and you gauge some global symmetry that these two theories have, and then by gauging the symmetry, you flow to some CFT, which is claimed to be the CFT you obtain by performing this type of compactification. And if this dictionary is correct, the dictionary between this compactification data, this six-dimensional theory, and these four-dimensional theories is correct, it has to be that the symmetry in the infrared of this four-dimensional Lagrangian will enhance. So this will be the main idea of what we are going to do. There will be a lot of technicalities involved, but this will be the main idea. Questions? Yes. Yes. The topology changes, yes. So, is, so let me repeat your question and uh, let me know if I repeated it correctly. So you are saying you, we are taking two, so two theories, two building blocks which have different topology, and we're combining from them a, a theory of a third topology, and then you are asking how this change of topology is affecting the theory that we'll, uh, we will get. So it will affect, okay? The theory that we will get will be different, will, will be different. like there will not, what we will find is that there will be certain rules that we can write. That if you have a theory corresponding to topology A, theory corresponding to to topology B, then a theory which corresponds to to topology A plus B, and by that I literally mean just sum up the genera, and sum up the number of holes and types of holes. The holes can have different types. Just this very, very rudimentary information will determine what type of theory you get when the topology is A plus B. Okay? More questions? Yes. Say it again. So you're asking if the enhancement is unique or? Well, the, you know, the, you define, so the, the question is if enhancement of symmetry is unique. Like you start from two, diff, two, two theories, you, you combine them and, and you get a unique enhancement. And the answer is yes, because you, what, what you do, you take two theories you, and they have very particular properties. And then you do a, a unique operation, right? You combine them by gauging some symmetry. 
It's a physical process. It goes to some CFT. That CFT has a very particular symmetry. Okay? So the symmetry in the infrared is unique, and that unique symmetry we want to determine. And before starting, uh, uh, how, how mu much time do I have? Three minutes. Three minutes. OK. So before starting next time, uh, the next topic, let me just make a conjecture, which will guide, again, us through these uh, 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 considerations. And we will conjecture the following thing, that any four-dimensional supersymmetric theory, any theory can be obtained by these geometric flows. Okay, so you start from any theory, from some supersymmetric theory in six dimensions, and then you flow down to, uh, to four dimensions. And uh, in principle, you know, this is a very special construction, and it, uh, you, you can uh, wonder why should it give all the possible four-dimensional theories. This will be our working assumption. Okay, this assumption might be wrong, but we will assume that, uh, that it is true. And we will see that we will get a lot, a lot of different theories and a lot of different symmetry enhancements that are known in the literature in the past. And some of them are new just by performing these geometrical uh, considerations. Let me just give you the answer for this particular case. So why this enhancement of symmetry happens in this n equals 4 super young mills? And here it happens exactly because of this type of logic. Okay? So there are two ways to engineer this, uh, these two theories. The n equals 4 superior mills with, SU, with, uh, uh, with gauge group SU2. You start from some 6D theory, which is called the 2,0 theory. And A1, 2,0 theory, we will discuss it uh, next time. And you put it on a surface which is a, a sphere with three holes, a pair of pens like that. And then you, gl you glue together the two of the holes. So the topology of the surface that you get is a torus with one puncture. So up to decoupled free fields, this theory is an n equals force SU2 uh, as uh, super young mills. And in some notations that we will discuss, this theory has a flux which is given by a plus half. Okay, we will discuss this next time. But there is another way to think about this theory. And another way to think about this theory is to start from a pair of pens which have a different flux, same type of punctures, but a flux which is minus a half, okay? and glue to it a tube which has flux plus one. Okay? And by gluing, as we will discuss, we mean gauging some symmetry. And in this case, it's an SU2 symmetry. So this uh, theory, which corresponds to compactification on a three-puncture sphere, will be just some combination of free chiral fields. And we gauge one SU2 symmetry. Okay? And the matter content will be just exactly as the matter content of n equals 4 super n mills, modulo of free fields. And if we do this type of construction, it's just a different splitting on this, of the same Riemann surface, we will get two gaugings. Each one of them is SU2. So the gr gauge group will be SU2 squared. SU2 squared is SO4 it will be exactly this type of Lagrangian. Okay? And what more, by understanding this type of consideration in this case, you can generalize these types of duality. So here, there was a duality between n equals 4 superior mills with group, which is SU2, to n equals 1 SQCD with group, which is SO4, because of some group theory magic, because SU2 is SO3. But the moment you understand this type of uh, this type of relations you can generalize to other groups. In particular, this type of relation between this geometry and this geometry exists for any group. Okay? And then you can devise a duality between n equals 4 super young mills with a CUN gauge group to some other theory. And these theories will have n equal 1 supersymmetry only for SU2, for A, when you start from 6D theory, which is of this type A1, these building blocks are simple. They are just uh, free fields. For other cases, this will be some more complicated as CFT. Sorry? I can argue for simply laced, but I think it should be true for anything. Like, because it's just geometry. You can make this breaking for, any, for anything. Also, 
In 6D, yes, that's right. That's right. Sorry, yes. Yes, I have nothing to say about non simply based. Okay, so this will be the power, and these types of magic, that's what we will try to understand in the remaining of the talks. Thank you. Thank you.